we come to chapter 3 and I, I want to just kind of give you a quick overview of how he begins. So, Vori's, Vori Bottom's desire is to just equip, to encourage families to get their affairs in order and to do what the Lord has called them to do, especially to the menfolk in the family. And we have read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that's the calling, that's the command, that's the duty that is left upon us, that if we are truly the Lord's people, part of that responsibility isn't just our personal enjoyment of our sins forgiven. It wasn't for the Israelites to say, yay, we're no longer slaves in Egypt. Uh, we're no longer in bondage. And we just get to live in the freedom of that. There came with that liberty, huge responsibility to pass on the uh, knowledge of the Lord and the commands of the word of God. Now, in chapter 3, uh, he presents really a kind of uh, fiction case study. He calls them uh, Ken and Barbara Jones. Uh, I don't know if Barbara's meant to be Barbie and it's Ken and Barbie and <laughs> what's, what's going on there. But uh, you have Ken and Barbara Jones and they're longtime members of Third Baptist Church. And they're married 15 years, they have three children. And he presents a scene uh, of their their way. So, so Barbara's very spiritual. She's at all the ladies' fellowships. She's, she's a kind of pillar in the church as far as the ladies are concerned. She's involved in everything. She gives herself to everything. She participates in the Bible studies and the ladies' fellowship and so on and so forth. And Ken, he's also well involved. He's a deacon in the church. He's, he's also very much involved in the church. But when it comes to in the home, if you're to analyze their home life, there's a bit of a disparity there. Barbara's a bit more diligent in her reading of scripture and spiritual things. Ken's a little bit sort of not really uh, manifesting particular diligence. And this comes forth especially in, in the home life because with the three children, they're, some of them are in the teens now. and they're, uh, What happens is, the way he pre presents it is just this kind of what he calls a typical American home. Um, the children get to a certain age and they have all these extracurricular things to do. Part of the time of the parents is really just shuttling them back and forth to these various things. Um, the eldest has just started to learn to drive as well. And at church then, the church they go to, this third Baptist church, it has... Uh, this, this early service that has, um, a con there's a contempt, I think there's a contemporary worship service. The there's Sunday schools going on, and then there's a contemporary worship service. And while the contemporary worship service is going, uh, is going his, his children are there, they've been at Sunday school, they go to the contemporary worship service, and then Ken, he's teaching a Sunday school for those who are going to go to the traditional service afterwards. So he's teaching there, so he's not actually at the service. And then uh, he and his wife go to the traditional service and they're there expecting their daughter to be somewhere, but she's actually gone. She's gone on home. And what he kind of draws is like, she, it, it, they learn that their daughter has been missing for a month, not even going to church. Like, how could this happen? But they, they are never, ever in this, they're never together. They're, 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 the Sunday school classes keep them apart. The worship services keep them apart. They don't even know that their kids are engaged at church. And he says, this is, this is kind of typical. It's very common to see this kind of thing going on. And uh, he can, he, he's, he's really driving against this, this kind of separation that exists, um, exists in the home, where he says they, that they rarely engage the children spiritually. They rarely take meals together. They've never engaged in regular family worship. And um, he says, the problem is that this family is in the same house, but they never share the same space. They share an address and a last name, but they don't share life. And he goes on to say, here's a problem in the family, but it's also a problem in the church. And so as he lists this, this particular case, what this church is like, as I've already said, he said, it's important that we recognize the synergy between what we do as churches and what we do, uh, what people do in their families. 
And so, I, you know, I'm reading this. It's, it's not the first time I've read through this, but I'm reading it. I'm going, you know, th this, this is so important to maintain that the, even though I maybe wouldn't go as far as Vody would in some of his condemning of what he would call age segregated anything, um, I wouldn't go that far, and I wouldn't go that far for two reasons. First, I don't think that's um, really what Scripture is saying, that you can never have these various categorizations of people. And secondly, history. The Jews didn't do that either. They had their various teachers and instructors and various things. The problem comes in when the, the undergirding philosophy is at odds within these various groups, and something is going on somewhere that doesn't mesh with what goes on elsewhere. And so it would be a huge grief to me if I thought what happened in our Sunday school did not mesh with what happens in our primary worship services or in anything else that we do, that there's a kind of collision of philosophy or worldview. And that's really what he warns against. He goes on to uh, say, uh, what families like the Joneses often don't see is their theological and philosophical differences. Mom and dad rarely discover this until they're thrust into the same environment. Most Christians think that a service that consists of people in suits, a call to worship, hymns, psalms, readings, prayers, long sermons, and benedictions differ only stylistically from services with people in jeans and graphic t-shirts, opening cover song, welcome, extended contemporary soft rock praise set, drama, and a brief sermonette. Little do they know that these are two expressions of worship. These two expressions of worship are actually expressions of disparate or different in kind uh, theological convictions. And so obviously there's a kind of broad brush statement there but you see what he's getting at, that there, there can be, though the externals are saying, well, these are just externals, but the externals are, are sometimes reflecting a completely different philosophical perspective. And so, sadly, this re reality is often passed off as a simple matter of entertainment tastes. Thus, parents will express the difficulty in terms of their children being, quote-unquote, bored, as opposed to acknowledging the fact that their children hold to a different philosophy of ministry and have actually, in many cases, never belonged to the same church as their parents. Sure, they went to the same campus, but from the time they were babies, they went their separate ways as soon as they hit the front door. And so you have... Um, this is where you have to be careful about those involved. And I, I take this... I say this as, a, as someone in oversight, and you take this on board as, you know, members of the body. Uh, you know, we want young people to be involved. We always want, we want to encourage youth. You remember Paul told Timothy, like, not a novice, like the danger of novice. One of the dangers of novice isn't that they're not equipped to do the task. The danger is not the lack of gift. The danger is the weakness in the area of desiring to be liked. That their primary longing is just to be liked, to be the friend. And so when they are given responsibility and they feel this sense, I am to be a friend, then they will let everything else be secondary to that primary goal. And that means convictions and beliefs and standards and everything else are set by the wayside and run roughshod over by this primary objective. I just want them to like me. Um, and that's the danger of youth. I know it can come at any age, of course, but that's, that's one of the dangers that is more prevalent when we're young than when we get older and we realize, I don't really care what you think. <laughs> this is kind of the way it's going to be. Um, and we, we learn over time there's an element of my way or the highway, sort of not in a wrong spirit, not in a kind of domineering way, but just, you know, uh, sometimes young people fail to see through lack of life experience, the things that age and experience can help us with. So uh, he has then this sub-point, take me to your leader, <clears throat> and he uh, mentions the fact that really what happens in this environment is that um, passively,
the Father has given spiritual authority to someone else. He, he has not been involved. He has not taken any interest in the spiritual life of his children, except for he has brought them to church. He has driven them there and dumped them off at the Sunday school teacher's classroom or whatever. That's about the height of it. And so without realizing there's been a usurping of the spiritual authority. And so what we have in Deuteronomy 6 cannot be done by the Father because he's, he's never engaged and desired to do it. And so whatever element of Deuteronomy 6 gets fulfilled in these children's lives is being done not by the person who says that this, these are nailed to the doorposts of our home, but the person who engages with them for 45 minutes on a Sunday. And that's, that's about it, which is very dangerous because, as you say, or as Deuteronomy 6 says, these things have to be discussed as you rise up, as you sit down, every day as providence would bring discussion. It's not like it's the only thing we talk about, but it's in that day-to-day -day environment that we get to kind of chip away and pour in and uh, help shape the lives of our children. And... Uh, the other side of it, of course, is his complete absence, as he says here, in the spiritual development of his children. So this is dangerous, very dangerous indeed. And so skipping on, he then says, he kind of talks about, here's the thing we need to do. We need to equip Ken to understand his role. And he says, once we help Mr. Jones see his proper role and responsibility as a family shepherd, how do we then give him the tools, motivation, confidence, and accountability he needs in order to step into that role and succeed? How do you do that? Now, he gives four, a four-part approach uh, to encourage the Mr. Joneses of the world that this can be done. The first is family evangelism and discipleship. The second is marriage enrichment. The third is child training. And the fourth is lifestyle evaluation. Um, when we step into the other chapters to follow, that, that's what he focuses upon. He elaborates on these four different areas. And so you will know it yourself. Like you, you will know that, that you, you can look at family in, in a couple of different ways. One of, one of the ways is, of course, that, that you react to everything that needs to be done. That, that, and most families are run that way. Most families are run as in, we're just constantly going to, this needs to be done, that needs to be done, the other needs to be done, and we go to bed, and we get up in the morning, and we start the same thing all over again. I need to go to work, I need to take the kids to school, I need to get their lunches, I need to get them dressed, I need to do the, the I need, it's all these needs, right, and they press, and you feel them, and you have to do them. But what happens with, just doing the needs is we, very, we can very easily set aside some things that are even more important, but don't bring upon them that same weight unless we understand how important they are. So the average Christian home is, is really, it's, it's kind of like Deuteronomy 6. They, they, they don't realize what the Lord has done for them and they just can drift through with all the benefits and blessings of their liberties, but they, they do not grip onto this. And so the commands of Deuteronomy 6 are there because people forget. That's, that was, that was the, the warning that came near the end of our reading, that they would forget. And of course, with the forgetting comes the lack of doing what they're meant to do. Um, let's let me turn it up here. So at the very end, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth. You forget. And so you don't do the things he's called you to do. And uh, that's what happens in many Christian homes. And we don't want that. Part of our role then as oversight of the church is to facilitate these various areas and to make people aware that you can be better. We can all be better. And if we're clueless about how to be better, one of the points he makes here about Mr. Jones is he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. You know he's a good guy, he's a successful businessman, he's a devoted husband and father, a deacon in the church, 
<laughs> he doesn't even know. And he, he talks about, you know, someone like him coming into a church that's run in a different way is, is like a, uh, what way does he describe it? Um, yeah, he said he would experience a sort of spiritual whiplash. You know, <laughs> like all these kids in the worship, everything kind of done one way, not the kind of accounting for different people's tastes. Um, and he said he would at once be convicted and repulsed by what he encountered. He says, I know because I've seen it dozens if not hundreds of times. It's like, oh, we need to, need to cater to the children. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because <laughs> what you do when you do that is you, 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 you shape their tastes. And then they don't understand why mom and dad like the things that they like. And they will, they will go somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. So we give them hymns early and psalms early and we expose them to everything. We bring them in as early as they can into the corporate worship with mom and dad and everyone else. And we shape their tastes and shape them. And so uh, we would drive sometimes and our kids would hear the, the contemporary music come on the radio. It's like, oh, you know, they're like, they're not interested. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> without us saying, without saying anything, you know, it's like, yeah, you know. Um, their, their tastes are being shaped, you know. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And so if they listen to secular music and, you know, if they're listening to U2 for like 10 hours a week and then they have one hour of hymns, they won't like it. They won't like it. They, they want it to sound like... I said that to someone. They sent me, someone sent me recently, someone not in our church, they sent me like, oh, what do you think of this? I said, it sounds like U2. It sounds like U2. Only U2 is better. So why would, I, why would I listen to this like half talented Christian attempt to sound like you too. If I wanted to listen to music, I would just listen to you too. Um, and they were they were appalled. They were, they were so offended at what I had to say. <laughs> that's, that's what it sounds like. Um, and so I have no interest, and I don't want my children to have any interest either. Come and sing the old the old songs and hymns of the church and the psalms of the church. So, anyway, any questions? One of the challenges is getting to Mr. Jones and helping Mr. Jones understand that he needs help. That's one of the challenges I face. How do I get across to Mr. Jones? Brother, you need help. And you need to ask for it. And even if it's just, if you know but you're struggling, even if it's just a matter of accountability, Let's, let's have, just knowing someone's going to ask you at a certain point each week, how are you getting on? Are you, you know, are you, are you, are you, are you staying on track? But Mr. Jones doesn't always want to come forward and say, I need help. And that's when, that's when people fall through the cracks. And that's when the damage is done. And children are lost. And they fall away. That's, we don't want to see that. So don't, if there's, if there's any, anyone here, don't, don't, don't fall through the cracks. Don't, don't say, I'm okay, I've got it. And yet you know deep down you, you haven't. You just, you're not. Reach out, reach out for help. There's no, no condemnation. I never, <laughs> I never have a problem with a person who says, Please help me. <laughs> you know, they can come with some awful things. I've had people sit in my presence with some awful things. But they've said, please help me. I say, absolutely, I will help you. But the most awful thing is when a man or a woman even goes on and will not seek the help. And it just goes from bad to worse. Family worship. It's, it's, it's like any other habit that's good for us. We're, we're easily pushed off the rails. We're easily, we, we struggle with consistency. Um, not to equate it to dieting, but 
you know what that can be like. And the key, as my wife well knows, you talk to people in that area and you try to help them. Um, the key is just getting into their head. Okay, so you had a bad day. Don't turn it into a bad six months, you know? It's like one bad day doesn't mean like, oh, I'm off the rails, so just uh, caution to the wind, forget about it, you know? And then <laughs> it's like, okay, you had a bad day, just, just start again, just start again. Every morning, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that every morning is a fresh start? Like every morning is, is new mercies. Every morning is that the Lord calls us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That the Lord says that the, each day we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That that's a daily thing. So there's always this like daily, just let's start over again. Let's get forgiveness, receive provision and start again. That I don't have to live under the weight of yesterday's failures if I come and say, forgive us our debts. Then I can just go, just, just run in the right path again. Praise his name.